Hannah. Hannah, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Can I just say I know perfectly well why you're all here. There is no bloody index in this book. <laughs> You've all come to try to see whether you're in it. And we will get to every single one of you uh, later on. I discover, um, uh, doing my final reading of it this afternoon, that I am in it on page really? 2,671. Are you sure? There's a only 2,000 pages. I mean a slighting reference to how much I earn or don't earn oh, yeah, compared yeah, yeah, with you, yeah, yeah. which we might come back to later. Uh, uh, in fact, I was walking my dog in the park this morning, and this guy came up to me and said, why do you write these fawning articles about John Humphreys for all the time? He said, oh, I hope you're being paid a lot. And I said, well, yes, I am, actually. <laughs> but he was rather crestfallen uh, and, and, and went away. Anyway, um, it is a real pleasure to be doing this. We will have a conversation which will last for, I don't know, maybe... Five minutes? Yeah, five minutes or so. Maybe we might stretch it out to 50. We will leave plenty of time, though, for questions, because I know a lot of people here um, uh, have come to ask questions. Uh, I'm sure Eddie Mayer is somewhere in the audience, and possibly uh, so, oh, some people have read the book then. Uh, <laughs> uh, and some others may well be here who want to, uh, and, and for a, a small fee, I'll come to you right at the, uh, at the start. Um, John, I got up at quarter past three this morning. Mm. You did not. No. Nope. Which feels like what? Bliss. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't, though, does it? No. Did, you must miss it. Yes. There must be something about it. Yes. What aspect? Any more of questions? It? Uh, uh, what aspect do I miss mm. arguing? This is true. This is true. A few days ago, a frog in my garden jumped into the, I found the frog in the sink, in a sink, you know, from you know, the pipe comes down from the roof and the, you know, the wastewater flows out and the sink. And there was a frog in the sink and it couldn't get out, you know, because it was, no. so I helped it out. I put my hand in and I scooped it up and, I, and as I did so, it started doing what frogs do and it would go, blah, 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 blah. And I started arguing with it. <laughs> it, it. And I thought, no, no, John, that's, that's, you know, it's only been a fortnight. What the hell are you going to be like in a... I, 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 yeah, I mean, what do else you, can you do when you get up apart from argue? I mean, do you, do you listen to it? Which answer do you want, Justin? Now, the honest uh, one, the honest one. I God listen say. to the headlines to see if anything important has happened. And I listen to see who you've got on. And on that basis, I decide. And I reckon it's probably about 50-50. But maybe I'll have it on in the background. And when you listen, do you do what everyone I imagine here does? Oh, and, yeah. Why the hell isn't he asking that? For God's yes, sake. Yeah. Yes, of yeah. course I do. Of course yeah. I do. Yeah. 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 And, and the number of times I've, I've gone for my phone, to text the editor to say, that is funny, you can't possibly... And then the, the finger yeah. is poised over the button and, yeah. and you realise yeah. that actually... And that one's, that's when Nick's on. That <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to comment. Oh, I can, I'm allowed to comment now, aren't I? Nothing is stopping me. I have freedom. Um, so no, it's not only when Nick's on. It's not... Do you that, have... That was fairly diplomatic, wasn't it? Too, yeah. too diplomatic, people may feel, and we might come back to that. Do you have this kind of sense, though, of, of freedom. Yes. That, w which has what impact on you, on your, on your life? Not very much at the moment, but I'm working towards it because I've got another book coming out in about six weeks in which I say what I really think. Yeah, it's, it's taken me a little while to adjust. Um, not, well, I mean, the honest truth is not very much because having done the book, I mean, I've said in the book pretty much what I think about things. I mean, it was weird starting the book because I'd, I'd actually signed the contract to, to do the book nine years ago, promised to deliver within two years, and then finally got around to writing it, starting to write it about eight or nine months ago. So instead of having seven years in which to write it, I had a few weeks, and a few months in which to write it. And the first few sentences I wrote, well, instinctively, I thought, hang on, I wonder what they'll think about that. Because you do, don't you? I mean, however, well, old hands like us, however, I mean, you're that bit older than me, but you, you, you do. You, you, there is just that little bit of your brain, and if you've been with a corporation, as I have, for 50 years, 
You've all, even though occasionally, quite often, you might defy the bosses, but nonetheless, in the back of your brain, there's that little red warning light that says, should you really be saying that? But and now you things, don't have to do that. But are the things you want to say, I mean, more things that, that, that might seriously not be in the book that you wanted, you find yourself now having views in a way that you've kind of repressed for... Well, depends what you, yes, I mean, not having views, I think I've always thought what I think, if you see what I mean, but, but haven't said it. But Brexit is the obvious example, isn't it? I mean, I, towards the end of my time there, uh, well, in fact, for the past three years, I suppose, I was given an awfully hard time by many members of the um, Twitterati, if that's what they're called, uh, for being a Brexiteer and giving a horribly hard time to Remainers, which was... Can I use the word? In, this is sort of almost a sacred building, isn't it? But nonetheless, which was bollocks. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I did not. And now... No lightning has come. Not, not, so. Yeah, no, I'm just looking up there. There is an yeah. old fellow with a long <laughs> yeah. beard, yeah. Yeah. with a bolt or something. Uh, and, and, and now um, I am able to say I voted Remain. Now, obviously, I, I could... <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, but... but I couldn't say that. I mean, how did you vote, Justin? <laughs> Luckily, I'm still on the corporation's <laughs> dollar. And I refused a glass of wine before we started. I noticed. So I'm not foolish enough to say. But let me put this to you on the Remain subject. You told me that quite soon after the, um, uh, after the referendum. Yeah. It's also become obvious when you read the book. You are a Remainer. Yep. You are an atheist. Yep. You are a Republican. I mean, move to Islington, for God's sake. <laughs> what, you know, what kind of a social conservative are you? What, why is it that everyone has got this wrong about you? Um, because you're not, you're not a proper representative of all the things that you sort of claim to be representing, it seems to me. Oh, are you sure about that? I'm pretty sure. We, may, we make fairly sweeping judgments about who are Brexiteers and who are Remainers. Too sweeping, ridiculously simplistic judgments. And there are plenty of perfectly thoughtful, perfectly intelligent, perfectly worldly wise people who see no reason why we should not leave the European Union. That's just one illustration. Republicans, I, what I actually said was, um, I think, was that the Queen obviously is doing a good job, and I did, I, you can't say anything much other than that, can you, in truth? I mean, the Not in your first book, but well, I mean... Well, I... well, no, but even in the seventh and eighth book, the fact right. is, the idea of getting rid of the Queen at this stage in our history is simply bonkers. Simply bonkers. Um, nobody would want... I mean, what, what, you'd have to have a referendum, wouldn't you? And how many people would vote to get rid of the Queen? 1%, 2%? I don't know, but it would be tiny. There's a difference between that and saying I'm a republic in the sense that I believe, and this is what I believe, that it ideally, ideally shouldn't continue. Now, it's going to continue, I know that, because that's what, where, the, where the people of this country are. What I would do as a starter, though, is, although this is deeply tedious, because I'm sure 90% of the... Anyway, um, is, is take an entirely different approach to the royal family as a body. I can see no reason why we should bow and scrape, which is what we do. No matter how you, we bow and scrape to members of the royal family who do what, apart from spend taxpayers' money? I'm not quite sure. And sometimes they represent the country fine, sometimes they make a balls of it, sometimes they are clearly rather nasty people with shady backgrounds, um, and yet we are required to revere them. And that's what gets to me. When your kids say to you, I, mean, I haven't got any very small kids any longer, but, but I can remember when my younger kid, my older kids were, were growing up, um, and I lived, in the, as you did, in the United States, and the message to every child in America, as you know, was any kid in this wonderful country of ours can grow up to be the head of state of this great country. You can't say that to a kid in Britain. Now, all right, we have a different system. I've accepted that. Of course, it would be childish and silly not to have accepted that. But nonetheless, I think uh, it's about time we took a slightly more um, sceptical view of the rest of the institution, because it's flawed, in my view. There is a challenge. Since you brought up Brexit, there is a challenge to you on Brexit, and it's this. You write quite a lot in the book about how the BBC didn't see it coming. Management didn't see it coming. Reporters didn't see it coming. We didn't get out there enough. No, we didn't. And that, and that is unquestionably your view. There's a more subtle challenge to you 
that I've certainly heard is that one of the reasons we voted to leave the European Union is that you didn't challenge people properly on the facts of the case. In other words, the arguments that were put on each side weren't suited by your interviewing style. The evidence for that? The evidence, well, the evidence is this. Duty. Evidence is this, that uh, there, is, there are two styles. Hey, uh, by the way, no, hang, on, hang on a second, hang on a second. Moment. Let, no, no, you'll have to shut up for a minute. <laughs> there are two styles of interviewing. One, uh, I think Evan Davis epitomizes, and you have a little bit of a go at him in the book, kind of gently, but Evan Davis epitomizes this view that when you interview someone, the effort is to try to find what the truth is. When you interview someone, your effort is to knock them down as much as possible because you, like a good barrister, are trying to see, test the wheels of their case. And the argument is, this is way too long a question, but the it argument is, is the argument is that actually Brexit needed the first approach, not the second. Well, there's an argument for that. Um, oh, I, okay. I, right, I, done. I would, I mean, I got, I've got to stop you there. I, it's time for the weather. I've, I've, I've actually, I think you've conceded it. I've actually forgotten what the first part of the year was so long. But, um, <laughs> well, I took exception, by the way, to the word truth. We're not trying to seek or find or prove the truth. Are we not? No, 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 we can't What's do that. What's actually happening? No, 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 I, th I think you're can, ah, ah, facts, yeah. But people can take one group of people who believe in a particular ideology or whatever happens to be can take a set of facts, which are indisputably facts, and other can take the same set of indisputable facts and reach entirely different conclusions and tell you that the truth of the matter is X or Y. That happens at, and has always happened throughout history and will always happen. Um, and so I'm nervous about the word truth. Whose truth do you want? Do you want Donald Trump's truth? And I use the word in inverted commas, clearly, when we're talking about Donald Trump. Or do you want Boris Johnson's truth? <laughs> or do you want Jeremy Corbyn's truth? They all have different versions of the truth. That's a cop-out. There is something yep, that you is... spotted it. Well done. There now, is I'll something that is true. I mean, there really is. There are things that are the case about, for instance, trade, about, for instance, the Northern Ireland border. There are things that are factually true about what is possible uh -huh. and what isn't. So the challenge to you is that your style doesn't, doesn't get at them. Northern, Northern Ireland border, good example, perfectly good example. It is the case, and this has puzzled me right from the beginning, it puzzled me, up to this day, that after Brexit, however it happens, there is bound to be a border between the United Kingdom, as exemplified by the, 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 um, the, uh, the province of Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. There has to be a border, otherwise well, we all know what would happen. Now, the effect that that would have is where you get into difficulty with the truth. Those who are unionists will argue that it would destroy the union. Those who are nationalists would argue that if you do allow the border to be recreated, it is inevitable that there will be, that it will destroy the, uh, the Good Friday Agreement, there will be violence, and the whole thing will fall apart, will come apart at the seams. Now, those are two versions of what they would regard as the truth. I don't know which of those is true. I've absolutely no idea. So all you can do, and you were almost right in your laborious question, you, um, all, all, all you can do is try to establish the facts, but then again, whose facts do you want? Do you want Boris Johnson? For instance, do you believe Boris Johnson when he says that in the case of the Northern Irish border, you, there is uh, an indisputable case to be made for um, operating the border electronically? or eight miles away from where the border happens to be, finding a way of doing it technically that, that isn't in operation at the moment but would work perfectly well, or the view from Brussels, which is that it wouldn't work at all. Now, now what set of facts do you want? All right, you bored me into submission. Uh, <laughs> look, look uh, can we go back to where the book begins and the wellsprings of what it is that, that made you you and made you not only want to go into journalism, but made you have the attitude that you have to authority. And there's a, there's a bit in the book where you go to hospital, you're a young kid, and there are posh doctors. Um, t tell us about that and what happened and why that matters. Oh, it, it seems to me that that matters a lot. Well, it, that, that's, it, it was an example um, of, uh, <laughs> of my view. 
15-year-old, 14-year-old view at the time, 14-year-old view that they were against us, that is to say rich people, middle-class people, were um, against us, the poor people. Um, it started not in my, in my hospital bed. Well, I mean, my father was, um, uh, how can I put this? He was a very strong man who had very strong views, who had absolutely no time for authority. He, he went blind when he was a young man, uh, when he was a kid. Uh, he had got measles and managed to escape from a bedroom where he had been confined because in those days when you had measles you weren't allowed to go out because the sun could destroy you. And he, he, his mother went out shopping, my grandmother went out shopping, and he, uh, he escaped from the house. There was snow on the ground, the sun on the snow, and he lost his sight. That did something to him. That did something quite profound to him because of the way he was treated in the years that followed that. Eventually, he managed to get a job, um, and in his first week there, he punched the foreman on the nose and lost his job and never worked for anybody again. And much more seriously than that, um, they, uh, my, my small uh, sister, uh, Christine, um, died. She'd been taken ill, not a desperately um, serious illness, and uh, was taken into hospital. My parents weren't allowed to visit her, and. Um, and very soon after she'd been taken to the hospital, she died. Had they been allowed to visit her, which they would have been allowed to do had they been members of the articulate middle class, because things were awfully different a few years ago, to what, a few years ago, 70 years ago, um, they might have made the difference. She might have lived because they would have spotted bum, 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 bum. No. Um, he never got over that. He hated authority. He was a French polisher who, if he not, and we needed the money, God knows, but if he knocked on the door of the grand house and was told to go to the servants' court, uh, entrance, he would turn around and walk away. <laughs> That's the sort of bloke he was, and, and I inherited that. He did not, he yeah. was um, a, a, a whole, a, a full-blooded Republican. He, he was a member of a club where the Queen's picture was on the wall, and there was one Friday evening when the club was absolutely full, he refused to sit in the only empty chair that was beneath yeah. the Queen's portrait, and he said so, and they expelled him from the club. I mean, that sort of thing went on all the time. The but it's more and you I inherited it, isn't it? It, it? it formed you, that formed it, you. It, it's it, so it, obvious it, from sitting it, in... It, it, near you it, for it, 10 it, years, it that's cool. And, 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 and the incident that, that, that yeah. you referred to, yeah. I, was, I was in hospital, um, I, just for the day, I mean, I was a day, I, I'd, um, I had a cyst at the base of my spine, so I was lying on the bed, naked, and the, uh, are you sure you want this story? And the, um, <laughs> I wasn't going to mention the cyst, and but anyway, the, it's, it's well, out you know, there other, now, Otherwise, there's not much point of it. Anyway, the, the consultant arrived, the grand man arrived with his uh, little coterie of, um, of student doctors, all of them obviously, posh young white males, and uh, and he ignored me, totally ignored me, because I didn't so much as say hello or whatever, didn't bother with my name or anything, he just, they, they stood around and he pointed at me, pointed at the, 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 the sister and said, you know, no real problem here, this young man simply um, doesn't bath enough, and moved on. And, um, and what I wanted to do was, well, A, punch him on the nose, and, and, and B, say, actually, you know what, um, I've got other things wrong with me as well, which are partly a result of the kind of way you live when you're poor. We didn't have an indoor toilet, you know, so in any way, look, that, but, but it affects you. It, it, yeah. it, it yeah. affects you. It affected me anyway, that, and maybe it's just, and, and I'm not, I am a different person from my then, Justin, as you will have spotted. No, but, but you are still punching that doctor on the nose, metaphorically, metaphorically. it seems to me, from sitting next Except to you for 10 years. Except that in fairness, they don't exist like that, I think. Anybody well, anyone who looks or seems to you like that doctor, and perhaps a minister of any party, anyone who is in charge... In authority. Anyone who's in authority. Anyone who's in cultural authority. This is one of the things that strikes me. Let me ask you this as a question. When you look at people who are in charge... There's a different group in charge now, aren't there, from yes. those days? Yes, yes. You don't like them anymore, do you? Well, it's not a question of liking them. We're journalists, and our sacred duty, God forbid, pompous phrase, but what we have to do, and it's only we who can do it, at least only we can do it, we've got people out in the streets a few yards away from here doing it for themselves, and that's fine, but we have access to power. We are able to ask you know, the old phrase, we are able to hold power to account. That is our job. And you can only do that, it seems to me, if you start from the basis not 
as Paxman would have it, although he was quoting somebody else, it wasn't his original quote, but as Paxman would have it, you know, you assume that every answer the politician gives you, he's lying to you. Why is this lying bastard lying to me? That, that's, that's the sort of Paxman I don't. I don't sign up to that, but I, I, and I don't use the word cynical either, I use the word skeptical. We have to be skeptical of everything Pretty much everything a politician tells us. But Otherwise, you, what are we for? With you, though, it comes from inside you, that scepticism. That's my point. I think it does. And for I you think as you well. are. I mean, well, I'm not so sure because I don't actually think I know anyone else at the BBC who has known that poverty that you described or lives viscerally. And that's the difference, isn't it? Viscerally, with that sense of, of disliking. Authority. I don't like the word dislike, really. Um, because it does depend on the individual, doesn't it? And you can't dislike a class. And after all, I'm a, you know, I'm a middle class, now, for God's sake. I've earned a lot of money, as you subtly pointed out. And, um, and, and, and I have, uh, I've, I've, you know, I have a nice house. And um, yes, I am, I, am, yeah. I am one of them now, aren't I? So, uh, and, I, and, and so, listen, Justin, you're a good mate, you know, but you're a posh git. You went to private yeah. school, you know. I mean, <laughs> And I've honestly, been made aware I, of that uh, every day for the last 10 years. Oh, no, no, that's not fair. Oh, yeah, e said, every, every, what are you wearing today? No, oh, God, there every, you are. Every, Jeans, I suppose it's all right for your class. Every week, I, I tell you, I had a wonderful exchange with Edward Sturton, who is a, <laughs> a wonderful lover. Who's allegedly posher than me, at uh, least. I, when I, we... I think by a mile, by a mile. But, and, but a lovely boy, I mean, and a brilliant, brilliant My mother would say there. not, actually, but anyway. No, quite yeah. so. Yeah, well, well, the thing is, we were talking about Christmas and stocks and um, mm. uh, whether you were hung up stockings mm. or whatever for your, um, mm. uh, your kids. And I said, we, you know, we, we, we always had a, an empty pillowcase. That was, that was the idea. And, and, and he said, um, yes, he said, well, he said, in our case, it was shooting stockings. <laughs> 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 and didn't, it, when I fell about, he didn't get it. I mean, but, but he's such a lovely man anyway. It is know. a weird, I mean, this is a, 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 a slight cul-de-sac, but it is another weird fact about you and me, since you bring up our relationship, that you worked with my father, yes. Peter Woods, the news yes. reader, who I never knew, yeah. but you worked with. You will know Peter is, Woods, right? Which is, yeah, there are yeah. people here who are of an age yeah. where yeah. he would mean yeah. something to yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Um, him, and, him and his baggy eyes. Yeah, yeah. baggy yeah. eyes and all the rest Great of it. Man. Yeah. Great but, man. But, but another oddity of us working together, and I remember the morning I told you. Yes, so do and I. And it's not often that you see him completely silenced, yeah. actually, but that yeah. was. Yeah. And I think you were going through, oh my goodness, what did I do with Peter Woods in the old days? Et Quite. Cetera, et cetera. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway um, right. Justin, you've got to finish the story. He didn't know who his father was. That's the point, until you were... Yeah. I knew, I knew, yeah, the sort of um, early, early years my mother told me, and eventually um, I, I um, blotted one, it once, out. Yeah, once his wife had, had gone, and I and I got in touch with his uh, his other kids, and uh, they very kindly allowed me to, to to say so, just so that my kids should know. But actually, in a way, also so that I could give him a shock as well. <laughs> I was thinking about it, that was a, an added benefit. Um, right, let's get to to. to to brass tacks. You rang me, I think a year or so ago, one morning, and you said, oh, bloody hell, mate, I'm in uh, trouble, you said. There's a tape. Oh. Uh, it's me and John Sopel, you said. And I, my instant thought was, oh, my God, I don't want to see that. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> actually, it turned, <laughs> it turned out to be an audio tape, ah. thank, yeah. thank the Lord. Yeah. Uh, it's funny the way your yeah. mind works, isn't yeah. it, Justin? Yes, um... Tell us about it. Tell us about it. I went in at four o'clock in the morning that um, Carrie Gracie had written a letter to the BBC um, accusing them, justly, of uh, badly misserving her, uh, actually breaking the law because they were paying her far less than they were paying uh, males doing much the same job, even though, this is the important bit, even though they had assured her that they weren't. I mean, that was the essence of her complaint. It was absolutely, absolutely rock solid complaint. It was slightly weird, to say the least, that she was continuing to present the program that morning because it was a huge story, obviously, and neither she nor I was able to talk about it because that was the ruling. And we're, you know, she wasn't allowed because she's not allowed to use the table and so-and-so. I wasn't allowed because she wouldn't answer. The... So it was, it was a very, very, very strange set. And most bosses did not want that to happen, but 
a couple of very senior bosses said, yeah, she's got to continue to So she was, you know, um, and, and when I went in, the first thing I had to do, having had a very quick word with, with Carrie, um, was to do what we call a pre-rec, a pre-recorded interview with your old mate John, well, our old mate John Sopel. Um, he was in Washington, obviously, I was in London, it's four o'clock in the morning, strictly private little chat, as we always had before the end, that we take the piss out of each other, as you know, I've done it with you many times, um, and, uh, it, it did, and I made some daft remark, I mean, completely, just a bit of mickey-taking banter, I think we call it nowadays, don't we? Saying, ah, oh, you earn that much more, you don't earn as much as you, blah, 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 blah. And on it went for about 40 <laughs> seconds, and we took the mickey out of each other, and that became converted by a certain group of people into me um, deriding Carrie Gracie. Just insane, the whole thing went absolutely bonkers. Were you tempted to refuse to present that morning or to ask her on air anyway? I, well, what I said the night before when they phoned me to tell me about it and told me part of what was in the letter, which was dynamite. I mean, it was a big story. There's no question about that. Very, very serious stuff. And my initial reaction was to say, surely she can't present. And the person I was talking to, uh, the then editor of the programme, said, um, she's going to have to. We can't stop her. I can't stop her. So there we are. Um, I didn't say no, I, I won't do the programme on that basis, and I don't think I was tempted. I don't think, and you might argue about this, and I'm not, I'm not a bit dogmatic about this, I don't think a presenter can or should exercise power in that way. Because you would be. I mean, if I had said, no, I'm not going to present, mm -hmm. the story would have taken a different turn. Yeah. It would have mattered about something. Yeah. And I'm not sure that we yeah. should use, abuse yeah. our power in that sense. So no, no, I wasn't. They played the tape on the PM program. Oh, yes, they did. But, but some days did later... Did they tell you before? They did not. So you're listening at home? I'm listening at home. It's quarter past uh, five on a Friday evening. This had happened on Tuesday, I think. A uh, Monday. And, um, and I suddenly hear, um, not the tape being played, but Eddie Mayer saying, women in the BBC, something like women in the BBC are being forbidden from talking about their papers, which is absolute nonsense. They weren't being forbidden. They were all over the papers, but they were forbidden, rightly in my view, from using their position when they were presenting a programme to make their case. I mean, that is, a, we might get on to the, uh, a more recent case of that um, in a moment, but, but that is a basic, basic principle of, of being a presenter. There is a difference between being a presenter and being somebody like you when you're in North America. I could say to you, what do you think of Donald Trump? You could say, I think he's a wanker. I couldn't. <laughs> Just possibly, just possibly. And I could... For I, the record, I don't. Uh, think no, you I don't. Know. He... He <laughs> is probably the only... <laughs> senior, <laughs> experienced, knowledgeable, intelligent journalist I know who doesn't. But Mind you, that's not going too well at the moment, is it? It's not going anyway. too well at the moment. <clears throat> it's not... Yeah. But, 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 but so anyway... You, hang on, so you, but, heard, you hear the tape going no, out. No, I didn't hear the tape. I heard Eddie right. announcing Excuse that um, this was going to happen, that, that um, this had happened, and then reading in... in it, it really was as, as though he w were reading the announcement made by the Prime Minister on the outbreak of war <laughs> or something. Very, very solemnly, what I said, what she said, what I said, in those tones that, you know, Eddie reserved for the most a and, nice soft and, Scottish accent yeah, but, but with believable profound but with profound regret at the same time profound you know regret. that such an awful yes. thing could have happened yes now yeah. you know and I know we're journalists that if you're going to report a story a controversial story like that the very first thing you do is you call the person at the heart of the story in this case me and you say do you want to come on and defend yourself had they we shared the same room, we shared it's the same newsroom. Um, they could have just popped across, walked 20 yards, they could have picked up the phone. Did you ever discover they, why they didn't? Yes, I do know why they didn't, because Eddie was determined to do it that way. And when Eddie was editing the programme, he got what he wanted. And he wasn't formally the editor, of course. He was not he? formally the editor, but you'd never guess it. Because I rang in, as soon as I heard that, I rang in, spoke to the editor, and said, I want a right to reply. Because Eddie, at no point, this, the whole thing about it is that at no point <coughs> did Eddie suggest I had been joking yeah. with Justin. Right. Uh, with, with Justin, you're Justin, aren't you? The other Steady. one. Steady. Yeah, I you, was not involved you, in you, this. You can't tell him apart. <laughs> with, uh, with, with, with John. Um, 
at no point, no, no suggestion that it, from him that it might have been a joke. Right. Um, and so I felt that I, I should at yeah. least be allowed to say, and it was a joke, silly, stupid, but nonetheless, you know, two old mates, and we are old mates, we're old friends, we've been taking the mickey out of each other for 30 years. Um, but at no point did they do that. And then <coughs> I, rang, I rang the program, said I want to speak to the editor, spoke to the editor of the program, spoke to the editor of the program and said, um, in fairly fruity language, it must be said, I want the right to reply, as it were. And he said, I'll call you back in 10 minutes. He didn't call me back didn't in 10 minutes. So I rang again, and this time was just a teeny, teeny bit more cross. And he said, I'm not allowed to let you come on the program. He's the editor. Now, there's only one person who could have stopped him doing that, and it wasn't right. one of the big bosses, because yeah. even the big bosses didn't know what they were doing. Mm. OK. Uh, anyway. The substance, though, of it is that you were paid an awful lot more than uh, particularly the women, but actually the other well, you people as well, as well and, oh. and me as well. Uh, so there was some justice in it, yes. <laughs> yeah, go on. Was that the result of an understanding of your worth that was fundamentally yes, that'll do. Yep. corrupt. <laughs> because you all arranged in those days, all of you who were the great stars, arranged your salaries with managers who were also overpaying themselves, I put it to you, and actually there was something pretty sickening about it. No, I don't agree with that at all. Um, I'd been, like you, in fact, I had your job in North America for, for six years and was paid the usual salary in those days, I don't know, it was about 40,000 quid or whatever it was. Um, came back to Britain, was asked to do the nine o'clock news, was told by management that I'd be idiotic not to go freelance. If I didn't go freelance, I'd be very silly because I was on the staff, of course, as foreign correspondent. Um, and they said, you can double your salary if you go freelance, at least. So I did. Um, and I doubled my salary. And then they asked me to stay program, but they had no. And one thing and the other, um, I wrote a column for the Sunday Times, for which I was paid quite a lot of money, and um, then was stopped from doing that and was compensated for doing it. Do you know, I never, ever went to management and said, I want more money. Yeah, but that's the extraordinary thing, actually, isn't it? I mean, that's the thing that I wonder about, and that I think a lot of people wonder about. I was always what stunned at how much I was earning. Was, what were they thinking? <laughs> when they, they paid you, year after year, more and more money? Uh, well, it wasn't, yeah, I mean, but it, it, it was slightly overdoing it. I mean, I was paying, earning a lot more than you, that is certainly true, but I was also doing Mastermind, and that was you know, completely separate. Um, and, uh, and another reason why I have, had been paid more earlier was because I was also doing a program called On the Record, the telly, which I did for a long time. And that kind of clung out. So I was working six days a week, and, uh, and you know what it's like being a foreign correspondent. Mm. I was away from home three or four months at a time. I reckoned, and this is well, not false money, I mean, I, I, I reckoned that, that I'd probably earned a decent whack. And if I'm to be entirely honest, I reckoned I was worth more than somebody who'd come to presenting from a, a somewhat easier life than I'd had, with a bit less experience than I'd had. I'd probably yeah. never been shot at, although that doesn't mean anything, I know. But nonetheless, yeah. it wasn't an easy life yeah. being a foreign So it's reasonable for some BBC presenters to be paid a lot more than others. Of course it is. Yeah, of course it is. I mean, that, that, that's the thing that I think now the BBC is, is now struggling with, is, is being able to say. And if some of those are men and some of them are women, it can be there very difficult and embarrassing. For to be clear about this, it is absolutely 100% unjustifiable for men to be paid more than women. Full stop. But then you have to say in the next sentence, however, if the man in question is the Director General of the BBC, naturally he should be paid more than somebody who is the Director General's yeah. secretary, for instance. Yeah. Incidentally, on that topic, on that topic, since we're on the men-women thing, I think, and I'm allowed to say so now, formally, it is outrageous that there's never been a woman Director General of the BBC. A hundred years? And no woman, so I, I have absolutely, I have absolutely yeah. no problem at all. I mean, of course, women should be paid the same as men. Of course, they should. But if somebody is doing a more important job, or is seen as presumably Gary Lineker was seen to be attracting Wagner. I mean, Gary Lineker, 1.75 million. Well, all right, 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, you know. You know these uh, sums, don't you, John? Oh, yeah. You've got them at your fingertips. Oh, yeah. Uh, let, oh, let me, we're, we're slightly running out of time. I want to get to what, what we in the BBC should be able to say. And as you hinted earlier on, there is this massive issue at the moment with, I don't know if you know, there's a thing called breakfast television. I've heard of it. It hasn't caught on, but you know, uh, uh, among some, uh, it is is a thing. Um, uh, And Naga Bunchetti said what she said uh, about Donald Trump and about racism and the BBC, it is fair to say, and I think I can say this as a BBC person, got itself into a considerable Mess. You, may, what, they, you want to try to say, can I abbreviate a bit? They made a total mess of it, a shambles. What should they have done? Horlicks. What should they have what done? They sh- what they should have done was pretty much, actually, I think, what David Jordan did. You know, David, David Jordan being the, the controller of editorial policy. Exactly. His initial response. His was, initial response was to say, as I understand it, and I wasn't actually here at the time, but, but uh, as I understand it, um, his initial reaction was to say, nothing wrong, but no reason why Naga shouldn't have said, as a woman of colour, I've suffered in this way and that way and the other way. Her own personal experience, she's entitled to say that. What her co-presenter, Dan, shouldn't have done was to then ask her the question for her views on Donald Trump's motives in saying what he had said. And I think that's right. Presenters, it's what I said earlier, it's going back to what I said earlier, presenters are not allowed to express views on controversial political topics. I mean... So where the BBC it, eventually got to... Was the wrong place. Was the wrong place, yes. in your view. Yes, yes. They, I think they were so... And that so, was Tony Hall who they, overruled... Well, they, the thing is, they were so... I've made this point in the book, as you know. Um, the BBC has been historically, and remains, I think, historically, afraid of certain pressure groups, whatever they may be at the time. I mean, back in the late 80s mid, and, and, and into the 90s, uh, immigration was a huge issue. The BBC was ter- <coughs> excuse me, terrified of being seen as anti-immigration in any sense whatsoever, so they went in the opposite direction. They were terrified of being seen to be anti-Brexit, um, and they went in the other direction. We regarded people, just, this not specific individuals, but there was a sense that Anybody who, who preached the Brexit cause, though we didn't even have the word Brexit in those days, did we? Anybody who said it was a good idea for Britain to leave the European or the European Union was bomb, um, they were regarded as a bit loony. They weren't regarded as serious people. That was the mindset in the BBC. And throughout... Yeah, we do so it. in this case, who are they frightened of? Who's bullied them? Oh, oh obviously, um, racial allegations. Allegations that they're in any way, shape or form racist. But, See, but they weren't being, it seems to me. They saying, weren't being. What supporters of, of, of Naga Manchetti say and what, what opponents of the BBC's initial decision say is, hang on a second, why is she being prevented from saying what she wants to say and bringing herself to it? When we know perfectly well what John Humphreys thinks about media studies and... Uh, I would uh, respectfully uh, suggest, organic Mr. Webb, farming that racism as, and um, media and studies are in slightly well, different categories. No, but, but they um, do know what you think. Well, that's, that, that's the argument. I'm putting it to you. They, they say, why the hell shouldn't she be able to say what she says about Trump because we know what people like I, John I Hunt think say. the serious answer to that fairly daft question is that uh, <laughs> me, me, media studies is a matter of monumental unimportance for most people. <laughs> Uh, sorry, um, but it is. Um, and um, soil, we talked about more views on farming. Yeah. 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 Um, I think we could all agree that healthy soil is a good thing and not highly controversial, couldn't we, really? I mean, I happen to think it's one of the most important things that, that uh, we have. Along, obviously, global warming is up there at the top, and the, so, the health of our soil is a massively, massively, massively. So I don't think that's too controversial. Mm. But I think to call the President of the United States, not that she did this, but ha- she, was, she was being invited to suggest that the President of the United States was a racist. That is a very broad view from my ground. I, mean, I slightly exaggerate, but, but nonetheless, that was, the, that was the direction in which it was going. I think that's wrong. When we get to that stage, and, and you can't, there are some things like racism, like immigration, uh, that, that are beyond... So, so how serious an error, if it is an error as you think it is, how serious an error has the BBC made? How, how, what, what potentially will come of it, do you think? I think the answer to that is not very much, to be honest. I mean, I think we're through it. You know, the old Alistair Campbell line, which was that um, for the 
for the story to become a, a catastrophe for the party or the government or whoever it is, for the story to become a really, really, really dumb, it's got to run on the front pages. I think he used to say for 11 days, or it might have been nine, I can't remember, but you know, that was the kind of length, span, the length of a story. And this hasn't pass that test, mm. I think. Well, I don't know, you may all think... Yeah, well, uh, people can the, bring, bring it up and then... Yeah, and then yeah, yeah. Oh, well, we got, got just a few more minutes before I throw it open to people. You, you, who have you not interviewed who you wanted to? Oh, that's easy. That's easy. You must have. I certainly have wanted to sit there on Monday morning and say, and with me this morning is Her Majesty the Queen. <laughs> I mean, you do, don't you? you <laughs> You, you just partly... I noticed she's not in a radio car. She's part, come in in she's, this fantasy. Of course she's come. That, Let's have the full fantasy, that, guys. That follows. She do, yeah. do, does, doesn't have to wear a crown, though. Well, okay. no. Right. Yeah. But you know, just, just... I mean, it is every hack's dream, isn't it? Apart from the fact that she is unique, she has met probably met more powerful people in her life than anybody else on the planet and would have views that are really seriously worth it. And, I mean, and there's the gossip, isn't there, you know? I mean, is Andrew really that? You know what I mean. You, uh, so, 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 the, so there's that. Um, anyway, anyway. Hang um, on, what's the first question? I'm assuming that's not the first question. What's the first question I, I, to the Queen? She's well, there, yeah, it's but, 10 but, past eight, you had but, the news bulletin, there's a few security but, people around. Yeah, but, but typically, you see, typically you're trying to frame the interview. Let me say what, if I may, Mr. Moore, what I want to say, and, and that is to say that I very nearly got that interview. Mm. How close? How close? Well, I had an invitation, a message on my answer phone, um, very fruity voice, saying, Her Majesty's commanded me to invite you to one of her private lunches. Me? So I went, obviously. And I, I, I do remember walking through Buck House with the, the rather tall and elegant uh, flunky who'd been sent to welcome me, to greet me, to escort me to the... And, and saying to him, I was feeling slightly nervous, I was saying, I didn't realise that people like me got invited to these sort of things. And he looked down at me, and he said, no, sir, neither did I. <laughs> <laughs> it was... Didn't, 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 didn't do a great deal for my confidence. Either. Anyway, we had the lunch. We had the lunch. And, and she went, we, we all then trooped off into the... But only, only four of us guests. And we went off into Hang the... Hang on, four. Four, four? four private guests, as it were. Four private guests and, 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 and Her Majesty. And then Her Majesty and His Royal Highness and one or two others. His Royal Highness I'd had a bit of a falling out with because I, I, uh, I, he accused me once and I used the language that he used... Can I expect? Well, I, I don't know. So, yeah. If he has Anyway, one. what he said to me is the stories of it. But he said, <clears throat> this in Mexico, on a dirt road in Mexico, when he'd leapt out of a police car and I was in another car and he leapt out of a police car and he screamed at him furious. The Queen was in, in the front car. He said, you stole my fucking car! <laughs> <laughs> it's not every day. <laughs> it's true. And you said? And I said, piss off. Oh, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. What I did didn't. you say? Because you like an argument. I, I'm, I'm thinking... <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of your father. Yeah, I know. And you... I, know. I, I said really boldly, sorry, sir. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, the Queen... The, you should have seen the Queen's expression. She, she got out of her car as well at this point, and she was just standing there going... <laughs> anyway, anyway, anyway yeah. we're, we're after lunch, and we are sitting in the, standing in the, this little anteroom where she likes to take her coffee and feed biscuits to those horrible little dogs. With. Anyway, and, and I said to her, I said, um, lovely lunch, thank you very much indeed. Um, do you think we might be able to do an interview with you at some point? And, you know, give her And she looked at me and she said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and there was, and, 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 and I, you know, then she stopped. So I thought, oh, well, here's, you know, I can build on this and make a, you know. So I I'd, 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 I'd delivered my prepared speech and said, um, well, now, let's just sort of think about the various ways in which it could be, you know, we could do this and with that. Um, and she listened very patient, didn't interrupt me at all. And she looked back up at me, I, I quote verbatim, looked back up at me and said, no. <laughs> what, what's more, Mr. Humphreys, if one were ever to do such a thing, it would certainly not be with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's why she is where she is and you are where you are, I, I, I suspect. Right, let's throw it open to anyone who wants to ask uh, anything. And, and we've got people who are going to come among you, as they say, in these semi-ecclesiastical uh, circumstances. They're going to come among you 
with um, uh, microphones and numbers as well. I'm not quite sure what the numbers are for, actually. Oh, but anyway, we got, number two. We've got several numbers, yes. I number one number and number two, two and there's yeah. a number... No, you've got yours the wrong way round, I think, up there. It's just number no, blank. There you go, number that's number two four. Here. Right, OK, number two. What so let's, let's, two? let's um, kick off... Well, let's do it by numbers. So we'll kick, we've got yeah. someone down here who's, who's waving and is number one. Um, uh, so just, just if we can keep them brief and we'll, um, we'll do them one at a time because otherwise neither John nor I will remember what the first yeah, question was and we haven't got, typically we haven't got a pen with us either. Uh, go. Well, firstly, thank you very much, both of you. It was entertaining. Um, my question is about the Iraq war. Uh, I deployed there twice, served uh, two campaign, t twice during the campaigns out there. I've never really understood the reasons as to why we went to war there. Um, I've studied it since. I've had a bit of a privileged insight. Uh, my conclusion is that Blair knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, Bush lashed out against terrorism and commenced a global war on terror. The British public was conned. And most importantly, Mr. Humphreys, Andrew Gilligan was probably right. Okay. Would yeah, you... I would agree with pretty much everything you said. We went to war because Tony Blair had promised George Bush we would go to war. We went on the spurious uh, basis that they had weapons, Saddam had weapons of mass destruction, which he could unleash in 40 minutes, which was complete balderdash. Um, sometime after the end of the war, only a few weeks after the end of the war, I got invited um, by <laughs> an unknown figure. They do it rather stupidly. They, you, you get a call from a, a rather fruity voice saying, if, if uh, we were to invite you to have lunch with a certain figure uh, whose name I'm not allowed to disclose, would you accept? And you say, don't be silly, you've got to tell me who it is. Anyway, the, the figure turned out to be the director of NI5, Sir Richard Dearlove. And, uh, and this, as I say, was shortly after the war, uh, by which time, as you know, um, no weapons of mass destruction had been found. And I asked Dearlove over this lunch, I, I said dinner, I meant lunch, over this lunch, um, whether it was true in his view, bearing in mind that he'd been briefing Blair pretty much every morning, uh, of his life for the last several months on the situation in Iraq, whether it was indeed true that Iraq posed a real threat to this country. And he, he said, and, and being a frightfully posh person, it's not that I'm hung up on poshness, you understand? Right? But, but, but a frightfully well-educated person. You decide. Person, or a frightfully well-educated person. He said, on, on any Cartesian analysis, it is our view that you, uh, Iraq would not feature in the top. And, and then he said to me, and how would you, members of the media, this is obviously why I'd been invited to this lunch, uh, private lunch, how would you, members of the media, react if we were to say to you that, of course, there were weapons of mass destruction. However, when Saddam realized that he was going to be defeated, he issued an order that those weapons of mass destruction should be destroyed. So therefore, we were not able to find them. How would you react to that? And I said, well, you mean after we picked ourselves up the floor because we were laughing so much? And he said, yes, I rather thought you might say that. And that's the truth of it. That's the truth of it. It, was, it was an insane decision by any standards. And well done you for doing what you did and for pursuing it the way you have. And in the way, though, that the BBC pursued it, And we all know the outcome of that pursuit and the crisis that it engendered in the BBC. In, in the long run, who won that? I don't think anybody won it because the residual distrust, there was already distrust, of course, between Blair's government, Alistair Campbell and us in particular. Campbell loathed us, as you know. Um, I don't think anybody won that because in the end people have to make up their minds and you've got one, I remember doing interviews the morning of the Gilligan, I, it, was, it was I who did that interview with Andrew Gilligan, you may remember it, 14 minutes past six on that particular morning um, and I don't know what the audience makes of it when you're getting totally diametric claims being made. How, how can the audience be expected? I think, I think, and uh, perhaps I'm wrong about this, I don't think people got a clear understanding, um, bearing in mind that we'd, we'd already had one so-called inquiry into the war, I don't think people got a clear understanding of what had happened and why until the Chilcot uh, report yeah. was published so the initial many, report many years that, later. That snapped the BBC around. Discredited immediately discredited immediately. As the Independent put it, and, and indeed the Daily Mail put it the following morning, big headlines, whitewash. And that's what And you was. still believe that today? Oh, totally. Yeah. Uh, number two, is there someone you're with? Yes. Here we go. 
Thank you. Um, I'd like to take up the question of the impartiality rule. What we've just been talking about underlines uh, the importance of it. A couple of things. First of all, John, you mentioned earlier on that you used to write for the Sunday Times that were asked to stop. Justin, you continue to write for the Times. What basically, as BBC journalists required to be impartial on air, what... Uh, ground rules are there when you're actually in print. And allied to that, um, LBC permit their presenters uh, to sound their own opinions. Um, do you have an advantage over them, or is it the other way round? Great question. It is, a, it is a very good question. Um, it's changed a wee bit over the years. I was allowed to write a column so long as, and it was the main column, so it, it got a, you know, a big chunk of space in a very prominent place in, in the newspaper, but I was allowed to do it uh, on the basis that I did not offer any opinion at all on British politics. It was a bit hazy as to what I could say about the rest of the world, bearing in mind that I'd been a foreign correspondent and had been expressing opinion about apartheid in South Africa, for instance, where the, the, the government of the day, the apartheid government, tried to get me recalled. I, was, I, I set up a television news bureau in, in, in Johannesburg and, and they sent, the South African government sent uh, the emissary, their, their ambassador here, to. Um, try to get me recalled because I was opposed to the government's policy and they thought this was, I was impartial. Uh, I, was, I, I, was, I was failing to be impartial. Um, and and the, my editor at the time, the, the director of News and Code Affairs at the time, who had the meeting with the ambassador, told me about it afterwards. He said to the ambassador, um, what's, what's the basis of, of, of you uh, demanding that Mr. Humphreys be withdrawn? And he said, well, because uh, he's not in favour of our regime. Uh, well, he didn't call it a regime, of course, he called it our government. Uh, so I can't do the South African accent very well, but I will try. And, and, um, and, and, and then he said, well, I, I, I think the rest of the world is, is probably opposed to um, apartheid. Indeed, we know that to be the case. So Mr. Humphreys and I, if he's getting things wrong, then we would seriously consider his position. To which the ambassador said, and, and I quote, at least I quote my boss, oh, but he was getting things wrong. Very, you know, he said, give me an example. Well, he said, in the first rugby test between, <laughs> between the Springboks and the, and the Lions, Mr. Humphrey said the first try was scored by Heldenace. It was not. It was scored by Robola. <laughs> I remained in place. Um, but the general rule was not as rigid as it subsequently became, because after Iraq, as, as we both know, the rules were tightened. Uh, I was stopped from writing a column completely, following the inquiry, um, I, I was stopped from writing, so everybody was stopped from writing for the newspapers completely, it was just a blanket ban. Now it's eased to the extent that um, we are able to write some stuff, we have to run it past the, um, you know, the, 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 one of the senior editorial figures, but as for doing what LBC do and allowing their presenters to do what are sometimes violently uh, opinionated uh, columns on air, as it were, express their opinions unreservedly, I think that would destroy the BBC. I don't know, it would be absolutely, in my view, absolutely unacceptable. We don't have a perfect system, but it's, it, it, we, we've got presenters like him and me have to be, or as I was, have to be seen to be, to the extent that it's humanly possible, have to be seen to be impartial. Otherwise, the BBC cannot be trusted. But and the BBC have... has only one currency, and that's trust. No, but if we have a situation, <coughs> which I think you may be getting at, where increasingly other major broadcasters, as their business model, yeah. have opinionated stuff, can the BBC survive as the sole place where they're not opinionated? Because aren't people going to say of the BBC, oh, you're just as opinionated, but you're hiding your opinions? Right, well, fine. There, there is an argument that says it can't. I'd phrase it slightly differently. If we get to the... Look, you guys, you people, own the BBC. You pay your licence fee. And without it, statement of the obvious, the BBC cannot exist. If you want an opinionated BBC, you would make that... Let's just try it. Let's just try it. Stick your hands up if you believe that people like Justin, not me, people like Justin should be allowed for the... No, just a straight question, I won't qualify it, but, but just stick your hand up if you believe people like Justin should be allowed to express views on air. 
even about racism? Yeah. I wouldn't allow that, you see, because mm. racism is against the law. We're against mm. murder. We're against race. Yes, no, but that's a... That's a no, no, that is no, an no, important distinction. Saying, there are all sorts of things that are against the law, but that still doesn't mean that you on air, that people here want people on air to be saying, yeah, I think it's a terrible thing. No, no, but we are allowed, if somebody commits a dreadful, dreadful, heinous crime, we are allowed to say hey, that man was evil mm. or whatever. And no, who would argue with that? You know, who would See, argue that, 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 that somebody who murders children... Personally, I think the issue is not so much what we write in the papers. As John says, everything we write in the papers as BBC people is, is, is red. And it's if, vetted, if, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's vetted. What we write on social media isn't. Ah. And, and that is the, the, the next frontier for the yeah, BBC. And I think the BBC is going to have to... Well... You, you've, you've rather... Oddly, for a, a youngster like yourself, you've rather stayed away from social media. I don't touch it. Mm. Why not? Um... Twitter obviously does a lot of useful, valuable things, but the price we pay for it is a, a rather nasty form of mob rule. Um, and when, when, when women MPs are being threatened with rape, um, and the, the kind of foul stuff, really, really vile stuff that appears uh, on, on the Twitter sphere, that's, yeah. I don't, I, don't, I don't feel the need to read. If people want to express opinions to each other, fine, let them, so long as they are not illegal, that is to say, if they espouse racism, then they've got to be shut up. Do you think BBC people should but be on Twitter? I would probably... You can't stop them, because it's become well, a... It's become, how many... Again, hey, forgive me for doing this, but just... John, hang on, John, you could what? stop them. You could just it? say to BBC you reporters, could. look, you're a reporter for the BBC. Then, it's a privileged position. Don't be on social media. And then, and then they would, I think, be entitled to say the rest of the world is on Twitter, from the President of the United States down. Why should we uniquely be banned from engaging in that public discourse. I think what you do, and this is what the BBC does, is says, they say, use Twitter, but if you abuse it, as sometimes happens, then you'll be disciplined, and if necessary, you'll be sacked. And that's how it, I think it should be. Yeah. All right, well, it's a fascinating question. I think we've heard it the is end important of it. Question. Uh, number four, come in number four. Here we go. Hello, um, I wanted to ask you about um, balance, which is obviously slightly different to the question of impartiality. Mm and particularly around editorial decisions uh, and balance over controversial topics, especially political ones. I'd be really interested to hear what you think about whether the BBC always gets balance right. Um, what do you mean by balance? Sorry to interrogate you, but what, what, when you talk about balance, what do you mean by balance? Because it, it is it's quite a complicated concept in a way. Yeah, I, I agree. I think So there are two types of balance that I'm interested in hearing your views on. One is about... Um, the balance between political parties during electoral campaigns and where you sit in the polls versus your priority in terms of being put, put on air. Yeah. And then secondarily on issues where there are is an asymmetric view, say climate change and, and or racism, which is not an opinion, it's a, it's a fact. Mm -hmm. um, but the need to present a balance of two arguments for the purposes of, of radio you might have somebody who supports a racist view and doesn't support a racist view, and that that is a, not a reflection of the true balance of opinion. Right, in... yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, I take a point. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's perfectly straightforward, and it has happened to me. I've had somebody on the, 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 uh, the Today programme um, who was allegedly um, an influential figure in his community um, who started spouting racist stuff to me, uh, as part of the ten past eight sequence, and I shut him up, and we got rid of him. People are not allowed to use the BBC above all BBC news programmes, and sometimes it happens in comedy, and maybe sometimes in live exchanges it's impossible. To, but as far as the BBC news programmes are concerned, people are not allowed to use BBC news programmes as a platform for racist views. Full stop. No, no, no qualification there at all. As far as something like global warming is concerned, we know, as a matter of fact, now, that global warming threatens the future of this planet. I don't think, well, I don't know, maybe lots of you would disagree with that. That is my informed view, and, and mercifully, it's the view... But should people who disagree with it be on? Well, <laughs> not given, it's, it's, it's an immensely difficult one. Um, 
Mm. It, would ha it would have to depend a bit, I think. If, look, let's assume, and this is such an unlikely scenario that it sort of is ducking your question in a way, but let's assume that the most senior scientists... Let's, just, let's take a, a, a really very silly example. Let's assume that the bloke who was uh, awarded today or yesterday, yesterday I think, um, the, um, the Nobel Prize for his part in physics, science, Nobel Prize for science. Um, and he, with his credentials, professor of blah, 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 and winner of the Nobel Prize, said, I've got grave concerns as to the veracity of global warming. You would have to report those views. Of course you would. But if a politician or a former camp or a, a sympathizer of the oil companies or whatever expressed those views, no, I don't think they're entitled. Because the overwhelming weight of evidence, the overwhelming weight of evidence is now, again, it wasn't. If, you, if you'd asked me this question 10 years ago, I'd have said, mm, well, there are an awful lot of people who would question, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's no longer the case. And, so and, you wouldn't have on climate skeptics at all? Um, I probably wouldn't. I mean, you, you, you'd have to... You'd have to construct. I, I can't. What, what, what scenario can you imagine in which we should have? Well, a we did it quite on? recently. We had Al Gore on, uh, and later in the program, oh, we had Nigel you Lawson. Interviewed Nigel Lawson. I interviewed him, <clears throat> and I, I failed to correct something he said that wasn't true, and we oh, we, got we, hell of a run we, that, we got a, a, oh. a real going over for it. And and but what a lot of people objected to actually, and I, I think this goes to, to what you're asking is what, why do we have him on at all? Um, uh, and, and you're saying, in those circumstances, we shouldn't? No, I think probably not. What about gay rights? Um, we have enormous pressure from some social conservatives who say we are being airbrushed out of modern life. If you sincerely believe that homosexuality is a sin, should you be allowed to express that on air on the Today programme or not? Yes, I believe you should. Why do you have a difference between that and climate change. Because one is a provable scientific fact. Climate change is a provable scientific fact. And 95%, whatever it is, how do you get to these figures, 95, 99 maybe percent of the world's climate scientists uh, agree. And right. that's good but enough on... for me, and it therefore should be, I think, good enough for our But audience. there is no real but, question. Hang on a second. There's no real question that people are born Gay, is right. that? I mean, well, it's, it's a thing. And what uh, gay people say is... No, 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 uh, yeah, but that's not what... It's factually, you... scientifically, the case, live with it. And you may not have people, and there are people inside oh, the BBC on, let's, who but, believe but, 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 Hang on, let me, let me put, frame the question. Who, yeah. who, who believe really strongly that it is no longer acceptable for other people to come on and say, actually, and question them and question them as people and question who they are. The difference is between doubting facts, scientific, provable scientific facts, and having a belief. Yeah? So if, and this is slightly changing the ground a little bit, but if, for instance, you have a bloke with a sandwich board um, on the street <clears throat> saying the end of the world is nigh, and if you've got another bloke with, uh, you, you'll say fine, you know, whatever, um, and, and you've got another bloke saying um, all homosexuals should be locked up. That is completely unacceptable, obviously. That is not allowed. If you have somebody who, as a matter of deep, profound belief, feels that we, have, we should not be allowing exactly the same rights is the wrong word. And I'm, trying, I'm struggling a bit with, with the word. If, if, somebody, if you are a, a Christian with serious beliefs, who genuinely feels that Jesus would have been a the, the Christian God did not want people of the same sex to get married, which a lot do, they are allowed to express that view. They should be they are, I mean there's no question about they are allowed. The law doesn't stop it. Yeah, and they're on the, and they and, but and, you and, want them and, to be allowed and, to and they, to are, they are allowed to express it. What we yeah. should not be doing, in my view, yeah. and it's kind of the other side of the case, yeah. the coin in a way, we, we appointed <clears throat> an LGBT correspondent some while ago, um, who, after his appointment, um, made a little film for the BBC, for the uh, website, BBC website, in which he said um, that he regarded himself, I'm truncating it obviously, as a mouthpiece for the gay community. My view is that he shouldn't be. 
Uh, we, don't have, we don't have mouthpieces for any other community, mm. do we? And I'm deep, deeply, deeply uneasy about that. That's slightly different, though, from this yeah, balance yeah, issue is. that the, the lady at the, yeah. at the top. And I, and I think, you know, from John's answers, and, and th th these are discussions that the BBC, of course, has, yeah. and they change over time. But, they, is, is but, the but, honest but just truth, and that's because belief, the, the, the big difference is, be, is between belief, well, three things, right? Racism, no place. It's against the law, apart from anything else. And I think every, I would like to think every civilized person in the land regards it as being a discriminating against gay people is against the law. Yes. And, 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 and we can't do that. We absolutely can't do that. But you might have, but you're you, still going to have someone on who says, I think we should. Well, <laughs> you'll still have people on who believe that their religion tells them that, yeah, but then, but if, if they came on and, and said, you know, gay people shouldn't be allowed to be teachers, then you'd yeah, run them out of town on a rail. Right. But there is a difference, I think, between a, a genuinely held religious belief and being allowed to okay. express it. And, uh, we went to four before we went to three, which is all wrong, but anyway. Uh, yeah, here we go. Yeah. Well, there's been a great deal of discussion about the decline of civility in politics in the public square. Do you think that is, in fact, the case, or have we simply become more sensitive over the past, say, 10 years? Well, I, I, can, I wasn't actually in the audience, but I can remember Nye Bevan calling the Tory sewer rats. Or, no, the lower than vermin, I think, was, uh, was his expression, wasn't it? So I think that was quite a few years ago. Um, they've always abused each other. Is it much worse now? I'm not sure it is, to be honest. I mean, they're behaving pretty stupidly in Parliament, but then there's nothing new about that, is there? Um, and they... Uh, are they, are they more disrespectful of each other than they used to be? I'm not sure that they are. You hint at one stage in the book that interviewing styles like yours, and you think back to Robin Day and Alistair Burnett and the people who kind of changed the mm. style, that actually that, in a sense, has coarsened. I think way. it might have done. I think it might have done. Um, do you accept, I'm, then, I'm, some responsibility for yeah, it yourself? Yeah, yeah, I do. Of course, yeah. Um, the, the trouble is, we were, on, we were on a journey in a very real sense. We were on a journey. We, we, were, we were kind of on a... From, from Robin Day and Alistair Burnett, um, before them, as, as we all know, it, a typically tough question would be, have you anything else to say to a grateful nation, Minister? And, and we've moved on a bit from that, and it's, and it's, it's probably... Or, or would, how, how, how shall we start, Minister? Shall we start with home affairs or foreign affairs? Foreign affairs, jolly good decision, yes. I mean, it happened. It actually did happen. And we moved on a wee bit from that. Um, have we moved too far? Possibly, but, uh, but only a very, very timid possibly, because I think we are already beginning to adjust ourselves, as it were. Um, I, uh, when I started doing it, uh, when I joined the Today program, um, I thought uh, that it was incumbent on me to be rough and tough and aggressive and all the rest of it, and I went over the top in the early days, I can remember quite well. I lost my temper a few times, it's absolutely unforgivable, it shouldn't be allowed. And, and I think, you, you may or may not agree in this uh, audience. On air, on, on air is on air, on behind air. the scenes. Behind, uh, it's, behind it's, the scenes I was as, as calm yeah. as a milk pot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, but I think that I have personally, since you're asking it personally, I, I think that I've become um, more... Um, Laid back? Would that do? <laughs> well, 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 a bit. How about a bit less aggressive? All right, I would settle that. I, I think I went through a period. I was a young man. I went through a period where I was probably too aggressive, um, too much of the time, and I think I probably did interrupt too much. I think now. I mean, then, I'm no longer there, am I? Um, I don't interrupt as much as many other people. I think there are many other interviewers who interrupt rather more than I did or did recently and, yeah. and it annoys me. So when I hear... Does it? It, it annoys you it, when you hear interviewers it, when, I, when I hear people interacting too much so you don't get the answer. I like to think, obviously <laughs> I would say this, wouldn't I? I like to think yeah. that I interrupted only when being completely pure, only, only when um, the minister or whoever it was was refusing to answer the question or even worse pretending they'd already yeah. answered the question and everybody could... You know, that sort of thing. I like to think that then if they were going off deliberately in a false... then I would stop them. But... Um, but yeah. maybe, yeah, yeah. And is that yeah. still, that should still be the rule 
for those of us who are still doing it, that the interruptions come when someone has been asked a question, the question is obvious, and they are obviously not answering it. Then you are entitled. Otherwise, you end up with a series of party political broadcasts, yeah. and nobody, nobody will listen, apart from anything else. So we have a responsibility to hold their feet to the fire, so long as we do it with a certain politeness. Um, I don't think we're allowed to shout at them. Well. OK, over there, number two. Me? Hello. Oh. Um, now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go on, speak. Sorry. Whatever Wrong number me. you are, you can um, adjust it. How, how long do you have to prepare for an interview? And um, has there ever been a time when you thought I haven't a clue what to ask? <laughs> Persian. Oh, oh very yes. Good one. Very good one. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. yes, a very good question, yes. Well, the one classic one, I mean, the answer to the first bit of the question, how long do you have to prepare? Sometimes no time at all. I mean, quite literally no time at all. I can remember on one occasion when the, the stu everything was crashing in the studio. I mean, literally falling apart. The, the radio cars weren't turning up, the machines were breaking. The whole, and we were down, it was about 20 to 9, so we had 20 minutes of airtime left to fill and nothing to fill it with. And we were all panicking like mad. The last tape was finally running out, so in about 30 seconds, nothing to put on the air. And then somebody came in, the, the, the studio producer came into my ear and said, we've got the leader of the Indian opposition on the line. <laughs> <laughs> And, 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 and what, what, what I wanted to say was, yes, and, why, and who is he, and, and that was it. Because then I was live on air with the leader of the Indian opposition. And, and I, did, I did what, I'm, I'm actually quite proud of this. Because um, leaders of opposition have one thing in common, they all want to drop loads of dirt on the leader of the government, because that's why they're the leader, and so on. So I took a chance, and I said, it uh, seems like a pretty serious state of affairs in your country. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> what? and then he said, well, you see this, and then we were away. So that was, so that was the, the other one that was, was slightly easier than that was, was when um, um, at 25 to 7 in the morning, uh, and, and the studio producer came in. I'd just done an interview with a chap called Gennady Gerasimov, who was at the time the most senior uh, information figure in the, uh, in the then Soviet government in Moscow. And, uh, and I'd done an interview with him. And uh, the, the studio producer came into my headphones and said, and bear in mind, this was the day, we were talking about this earlier, the days when uh, producers on the Today programme weren't, how can we put this politely, entirely sober all through the night? <laughs> Occasionally, occasionally. Anyway, he came into it and he said, we got Margaret Thatcher on the line for you. And I thought, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and the next second I heard, oh, Mr. Humphreys, good morning. <laughs> and she, imagine that happening today in these God, controlled at the times. She'd been in the kitchen, number 10, making herself a cup of tea, literally. And, uh, and she heard what I was saying there and she said, she, she, told the switchboard, put me through to Mr. Humphreys. And, and they phoned, the, 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 anyway, there we are. And, and there she was. So I said, well, as, since, since we've got you, we might as well talk to you about other things as well now. And she said, well, for quite a while. So, and um, I, I remember, do you remember Bernard Ingham, her, um, mm. yeah, her, her, her uh, chief information or press mm. officer, whatever, very, uh, anyway, he, uh, he told me years later that he'd been driving into work when he heard that exchange. <laughs> and, and he said, and I heard you say we got that, I heard a voice, I nearly dropped off the fucking road. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have another one. There, oh, right but, there, but I didn't, right sorry, there. forgive me, oh, no, I, yeah, actually, I, did no, what, didn't, no. I didn't answer your question. Yeah. The answer is, most of the time, yeah. if it's a seriously, if it's an interview with the Prime Minister, you usually get, um, you'll, you'll know about it ahead of time, so you'll have maybe a few hours the day before to prepare, or, uh, Usually, if it's somebody as senior as that, maybe if it's Charles Xavier, maybe you'll know, but not necessarily. As often as not, you will have virtually no time to prepare. And, and the other problem is that if you go to bed, as you do, well, in my case anyway, I used to go to bed at half past eight, get up at half past three, um, you're not going to be able to be informed about what's happened in Parliament over the last whatever it is, and so on and so on. So there'll be a huge amount you don't know, and, and often you are not prepared 
you haven't been produced. Not because we like to live dangerously, but just, it just doesn't work like that on a, on a program like today. Different if you're doing World at One, for obvious reasons, but on today, you're, you're often pretty much flying blind. Do you, have which a, is why do you have a first question written down? No, no. Do you know what it is before no, you get No, not necessarily, there? and that's very stupid. <laughs> I, I, I cannot defend that. I, I, can, I tell myself that it's actually, by having no questions written down, it's, um, it enables you to have a proper conversation so you can respond to what the person has just said to you and you can, you know, and that's really, really the right way to do it. The truth is that I just can't do it. I mean, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, go in at four o'clock, look at the running order, and then find 27 different reasons for not even bothering to, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, weird, isn't it? And you know it's stupid. You know that if you're going to interview so-and-so at 10 past eight, you should be worrying about that and planning it all. And, say, and you don't. You find anything to do. Oh, there's that bit of lint in the corner of the computer screen. That, you know, oh. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Madness. Right in the middle. Yes. Number four. Thank you. Um, given that you've been at the heart of the news, and if we put climate change as an existential threat to one side, what do you think the greatest threat to the UK is now? I, I, well, I think to the world is um, a potential catastrophic technological breakdown. Um, I think that has got to be considered real. If we're going to have, uh, I mean, what do I know? Your guess is as good as mine. But the, the, the reliance that all of us have now, every single individual human being, except for tiny babies, I suppose, has on the technicians, the technical whiz kids getting it right um, is absolutely terrifying. And the ability for the other, the people who want to cause mayhem or want to become terribly rich by blackmailing this or that or uh, rogue state powers or simply rogue terrorists who want to cause, uh, um, is, 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 is great. And I'm not sure that we have the wherewithal in every sense, intellectual, technical, material, the wherewithal to combat that if it were to happen because it would be so damned swift that the system would break down. I mean, they say that there's three days supply of food in, in the supermarkets, for instance, and supermarkets cannot survive, cannot operate the way they operate without um, their computers. And, and if the thing breaks down, God knows where we are. And, and then many, 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 even more seriously. Yeah, I, I think probably that's what's going What's your me personal more. relationship with technology? Not, 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 um, I, I will not threaten Bill Gates, let's put it like that. Um, I am not. But you but, use computers. I mean, when I first, when I first joined the Today program, I reveal this to you because I'm not sure John's going to get there, but John used to, we have computers in the studio, and the first thing John would come in and rather over-violently put the computer Ooh. down so that he couldn't see the screen. Hmm. But now you do use the screen. You're, you're on a journey. I'm on a I, journey, yeah. Pretty soon. Have you got, you've got these phones now that don't have to have... Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no lines, wires to join them up, yeah. You're yeah. a user I'm, of technology, though, aren't you? Of course I'm. You're not, you're not, you're course, not, a, you're not a Luddite. No, 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 no. I'm okay. not. But I really didn't think that computers helped in the early days and what people were doing. We had a particular colleague, I won't mention his name, but he spent half the program when you could do this sort of thing, and it was unusual to be able to do it on the computer, booking his holidays and stuff. Well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and you know who it is. Yeah. Yes. If I were a journalist worth my salt, <laughs> I would press you on who it was. But actually, I'm not going to. There's someone right at the very top there, next to number four, and then we'll come down this side as well, yeah. Thank you, Justin. Hello, John. Um, John, on the record was a great program. It was axed, and I was very sad about that because yeah, that's where I first saw you. Yeah. My question, and you've touched on the answer to this question, and that is about politicians. The quality of politicians in Britain today and indeed America. What's your view on that? Good one. And, and what's your view yeah. also? Who are the best three? Sorry, who are the who are the best three politicians in the last thirty years in the UK or the US, and who are the worst three? On the record, please. I think there's probably a bit too much in there for, for the remaining minutes that we've got left. Um, but I'm not absolutely convinced that politicians are any worse than they ever have been, with this exception that um, a few years ago, and it's not that very long ago, there was a wider spread of um, 
different sorts of people in the House of Commons. I mean, it, it, it is a little while ago, but nonetheless, there was a time when we had trade union representatives who'd worked in factories, when we had lots of teachers, when we had lots of people who were not part of the political scene. Now, it's becoming vanishingly unlikely. Your, your, your path into politics now is you leave university, you go and become a SPAD or an assistant deputy SPAD, special advisor, and then you stand in line patiently and a seat becomes vacant and you apply for the seat and you join the House of Commons. So you have too many people who all look and sound alike, I mean in the sense of their, you know, the way they approach politics, and, and they are, I think, somewhat isolated. There aren't enough people who know, awful cliche, but there aren't enough people who know what makes ordinary people tick. That, that's, that's what worries me. So then name those who do and those who don't, that's what he wants. Yeah, well, it's very, very difficult. We haven't had a prime minister um, since John Major, who was part of that other group. Now, so Major, you approve of? Uh, well, well, well I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I, um, because, I'm, because he wasn't a very effective prime minister in, in, in so many ways. Thatcher, well, you, you couldn't but argue that Thatcher made a huge impact on this country. Um, you can certainly argue about some of the decisions she took. Um, of course you could. There are two and in the book. There are two in the book. Um, uh, Ken Clark yeah. and Robin Cook. Yeah. But, but it's fair to say both of those you, you like and admire as people. I, ad that, I, so admired, I admired Robin Cook, uh, A, because he was terribly bright, and, and incidentally was also <clears throat> aware, overly aware in my view, of, of, of the figure that he cut on the public stage. We were... We were standing in the gents' loo at one point. After we, it was John Smith had just died as leader of the Labour Party. Everybody was wondering who was going to be the new leader of the Labour Party, and it was Robin Cook, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown. Those were the three. And, but but none of them had actually thrown their hat into the ring at that stage. And I, we were standing there washing our hands, and uh, with a mirror in front of us. And I, <laughs> and I said to Robin, because he wouldn't say, I tried to get him on the programme to say, and he wouldn't. And I said, Come on, Robin, you can tell me now. You're going to have a go at the leadership, aren't you? And he said, No, I'm not. I'm not, I'm really not. And I said, why? Because he's a very bright man and courageous too. Remember, he resigned over the Iraq war. Um, the only one to do so at that stage. Claire Short came later. But anyway, um, he said, uh, I said, why, why not? You're a bright man. He said, look in the mirror. I said, yeah? he said, look at that face. Pointing at this face. He said, I'm, I'm too ugly. <laughs> and I thought that was yeah. terribly sad. Um, so I, I rated him hugely. And yes, I rate Ken Clark because partly because um, he has a sense of humor. Um, he doesn't take himself too seriously in lots of ways, but also because he is extremely bright and he does um, have a sense of what ordinary people in the street think. And, and maybe he's not afraid to say well. so. And uh, might yeah. even temporarily be our next prime minister. Down to number one. Unlikely, yeah. yes. very unlikely. Good evening, Mr. Humphreys. My question is, um, if you were able to give the controller of Radio 4 some advice to in guarantee its future in a world of increasing um, media streams with podcasts and Netflix and another channel every week, what would those words of wisdom be? God, I wish I had some. Do you know what I think they'd be? And you'll be very disappointed with this answer. Don't worry too much about what they're doing on social media, for instance, or indeed what any, anybody else is doing. Radio 4 exists and prospers, and I know what you're going to say, young people aren't switching on, and that is a danger, but Radio 4 exists to be an intelligent voice appealing to a certain group of people, and that is always going to be the case. It will always be a certain section of the population, it has always been, will always be a certain section, a, a pretty broad section in, in many cases, certainly for, for, for the news programs on Radio 4. But what we cannot do, and my advice, <laughs> the idea they let, but anyway, my advice would be don't, it's not a race to the bottom. Don't engage in a race to the bottom. Don't look at social media and say, ah, this is the way you get the kids, because it's not. When I joined the, the, the program, 33 years ago, they said, they were quite open about it, they said they'd given me the job because I was young. <laughs> Imagine that, being young. Um, and, and we had, we absolutely, the Radio 4, the A program especially, had to appeal to younger people because they were, but you know what happens? Um, younger people get older. 
and then they die and other younger people come along and so on. And there is this kind of circle. And we still, I mean, when I joined the program, and I'd like to say this is entirely down to me, it may not have been entirely down to me, but when I joined the program, there were four million listeners. <clears throat> we now have seven million. And the fact is, that's because young people are not as thick as lots of us say they are. They're actually pretty bloody bright, and a lot of them do listen to, the, to, to, to Radio 4, albeit on different media. That's fine, they haven't got to sit there with a wireless set in front of them, obviously, and they listen on the phone, whatever. But they will listen if we're offering them the right material, and we've got to stay serious. That's the thing. Radio 4 is for serious listeners, or it's, there's no point. That is... That is a wonderful moment, uh, a wonderful thought with which to end. I love it that you still say we have I know, to do this. I know. You know, you when got through that, that whole interview without ever even going to stop. Without what even mentioning Mastermind, which is. He wants to mention Mastermind no, because you, he wants you to know that he hasn't retired. Well, okay, that's... he hasn't <clears throat> retired. You can meet him now and he'll sign a book for you. I think you're going to do that. I assume out at the front. It's not going to be happening here. I can't say any books mm. here. Can I just say it has been the honor of my lifetime to sit next to you for the last 10 years. You're not a perfect person. You're not a perfect interviewer. <laughs> Uh, but you are one of the most extraordinary and dynamic people I've ever met, and it's a real pleasure, John. All and can I people. say... <laughs> can, can I say... Can I... Can, <laughs> can I say... That no. I agree with every word of that except... <laughs> <laughs> Except that it applies to him. He's no, no, absolutely doesn't. bloody That's it. brilliant. We're out of here. We're out of here. Thank you very much. Come on. Thank you very much. You're done.